What's going on, guys? It is finally here. UFC 300. Um, 299 is going to be tough to beat from an action perspective, but 300 is here. We're super, super psyched for it. I'm super psyched for it. I'm not even doing this in the studio. Uh, usually I have the studio with me, behind me. Or I got Mackenzie cutting everything up. Um, I'm doing it from home. I'm doing it at night. Nobody's around. I got my phone on silent. I got my coffee in hand. And I just want to slow roll this. I want to relax. I want to talk to you guys. I don't want to rush through it. Sometimes we just like rush through the show to get it through. I want to take you through a bunch of things, a bunch of different scenarios that a lot of people just won't take you through. Um, there's a lot of outlets out there now. I mean, you could just literally type in UFC 200, uh, UFC 300, and you'll see all of a sudden now there's 150 different providers giving their content, and it's all the same rigmarole. And I'm not afraid to say it because I have a leg to stand on to say it. I've been in this industry for a lot longer than 90% of these people. Um, you know, uh, so I, I can say that I've seen the wave come in and I've seen the wave go out and I've seen the wave come in. But now it's just a, a, it's a, it's just a monstrous wave of just anybody coming in, setting up their YouTube. And, you know, our business really isn't predicated on YouTube. We do the show as a courtesy just to do it. We don't really keep up with it as much as we should. Um, we have other fish to fry. We have obviously the MadLabMMA.com. That's where our, our bread and butter is. That's where our content is. That's where all our subscribers are. That's, you know, the people who take care of us. We want to take care of them. Um, you know, but I do feel when I do come down and break some of these cards down, I got to give you a different angle and I got than the normal, well, he throws good punches and he throws good kicks and, well, he has no takedown defense and he lost to fighter A, but fighter A beat fighter C and fighter C beat both fighter A and B. And it, it's just, it's, I can't even like look at some of the outlets anymore. And, you know, I was thinking about actually changing around the show a little bit to start calling some of these people out on their, on their nonsense. You know, because there's so many prediction shows out there and there's so many shows out there that you just click on and even the fighters now are doing it. You know what I mean? Which you, you can't fault them for doing it. I mean, they got to make money. If there's another outlet where they can make money off of the leverage of their fighting, so be it. That's fantastic. But when you get these guys with headphones on and all of a sudden they appear out of nowhere, it's like, are you really going to put your hard-earned money into them? You know, so... Um, I do want to break it down from a, a little different perspective tonight. Um... Before I get started, I do want to talk about some some uh, some news and notes. Uh, first of all, we are throwing a very awesome promo. We believe in you know taking care of our subs over at themadlabmma.com. We take care of everybody. Uh, we're like a very tight family over there. I know there's a lot of companies um, that they have very toxic discords and they have very toxic members and who's going after who and who's you know talking about this one's mother and that one's mother. We don't tolerate any of that. And we actually built a foundation of our company for a community, not so much for yeah the content and the wagering and the DFS is all top shelf stuff. And that's what you're initially signing up for. But as time goes on, you start to realize you're really not that there for that anymore. You're there for the community. You're there for the people. You're there for how, how sharp and how knowledgeable, how, how intelligent these people are, and how a lot of these people just become friends. You know, I become friends with numerous amounts of my subscribers. I talk to some of them daily, you know, whether it's over text message or whether it's over phone or whether it's in a Discord. Um, anytime we have a problem, we have no issues with booting people out. We haven't had that many problems, but I, I have done it before, where once you disrespect one guy to a point where it's, you can't come back from it, you're out. You know, so you'll see, like, when you sign up for the site, you're signing up for the content. Like, that's originally what you're signing up for. You're reading all the breakdowns. You're getting all the metrics. You're getting all the DFS. You're getting all the wagers. You're getting the podcast, the private live stream. We give you more than any other site. That I can promise you. Whether it's right all the time or it's wrong, it, it's a chess match. But we're giving you everything you need to make up your own decision. That's basically what we want to do at this site. We don't want to give you the answers. There's a lot of outlets out there that you're paying $125 a week and they send you a text message. Or there's a lot of outlet, outlets out there that actually write articles within their Discord. And they give you 50, 60, 70 units of plays a week when they're not even playing them themselves. You know what I mean? We give you very realistic wagers. We give you everything. We send you SMSs telling you that like a new wager is in or the article is up or we keep you in a loop with everything. We, we run this like a very legit professional business because that's what it is. And that's why we've been a flagship for such a long time. Um, you know, so when you join, like I said, you're initially joining for that. You're joining for 
the content. You're joining for all the perks that you get, you know, within the website itself, within the outlet itself. But as time goes on, man, it's it's just hard to not watch it with these guys. Like I know for me, like I went to Vegas uh, a couple weeks ago with Bush, and there was a couple of the subscribers that came with us. But I'm so used to on Saturdays being in my Discord and seeing all them names, you know, seeing Jonas, seeing Anthony Walker, seeing you know um, uh, uh, Mike Bing Bang Boing, seeing uh, J Mac, uh, Brent Dexter. Jeff Dyke, like seeing all these guys, um, you know, Zach, I can go on and on and on and on and on and on with the, with the names, you know, so if I miss you, you guys, there's just a lot of you, I, I can't get, but you guys get the gist of it, like, and if one of them's missing, I know it, like, I know it, I'll be like, where's Marin Jelly, or where's Showdown, or where's this one, or where's this, like, I'll know it, like, I'll know, like, somebody's missing, where are they, who went to a wedding, who went to a soccer game, like, it's a very different culture that we have. So what we're doing is, like I said, we give back to them. They give to us. We give to them. But we also got to remember we have to give back to the fighters, right? So one thing that we're doing this week, which is super, super cool, we're running a contest for members. If you join, you'll be included in the contest. We're running it as a DK contest. And basically what we're doing is the top three winners, the top three on the bracket win. First place will get their choice of um, Dustin Poirier's hot sauce, a, a gift box of Dustin Poirier's hot sauce. A choice of Ma uh, Miranda Mavericks pickles, Prowse pickles, I think it's called. And also um, your choice, Matt Brown's Immortal Coffee. These are three fighters. These are three guys who have other outlets to make some revenue, to make some money that we feel like we should support. So you guys aren't putting the money out. We're putting money out. We're sending it to you. The one thing that you could do if you do win one of the prizes is taste it, maybe take a picture of it and review it for them. Not for us. Put it on their website and say, I had Miranda's pickles, they're amazing. Or I had Dustin's hot sauce, it's amazing. Or I had Matt Brown's coffee, it's amazing. Give back to them. Like, these guys give us every week. Every week these guys give us, and nobody ever thinks about giving back to them. So we're giving back to them. We're going we're gonna to purchase some of their products. We're going to allow our members to go in and have a contest and have fun in DraftKings as a free contest. And the top three people are going to get their choice of those three products. And we're going to ship them out to you, and we're going to support them. And, and everybody's happy. So something pretty cool that, that, that we're doing. Um, and I'm actually looking for it because we usually do giveaways on these big cards, but we're usually giving away like, you know, memorabilia and cards. And that's all fine. That's all great. But you're not really supporting the fighter at that point. You're not supporting the person that every Saturday when we're all buckled in watching, they're giving us entertainment. Let's give back to them a little bit. Like these guys don't make a ton of money. They do good for themselves, some of them. Yeah, but... They don't make a ton of money. We're winning bets on these guys. Like Dustin Poirier, of all people, he cashed us out a huge bet, you know, um, against um, um, Benoit Saint-Denis. You know, so like him right there, boom, I'm giving him. I'm going to get the, the box of, of, of sauce, send it to whoever wins. Matt Brown Coffee, even though he's really not active, he still, he still gave us years of his, of his career. Miranda Maverick, young girl, trying to spin off a side business to try to generate some money until she gets those bigger paydays. Why shouldn't we support them? So that's what we're going to do. So if you guys are interested in coming over and joining for the week, you can join for the week, which is under $20 for the week. You're getting all the content. You're getting the Discord. You're getting everything from soup to nuts. You will not find more, more content anywhere. That I promise you. Like I said, I'm not going to promise you that I'm, that I'm going to be right all the time, but I can promise you, you, you will not get more content that we give. This is all we do. We don't do anything else. Soccer, baseball, we do nothing but MMA. Um, so for $20, you're getting all that, you're getting all the wagers, all the DFS, everything you need for Saturday night, but also you're getting a chance to go into a contest and win prizes that are worth much more than $20, you know, and you're also getting to support a fighter and, and maybe get some, a product that you might like and maybe reorder again. So the MadLabMMA.com, we got a multitude of different, um, uh, 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 subscriptions from weekly to monthly to yearly. If you just want to come in for the week, I guarantee you'll stay longer. All right, let's get into this card. So this is a really good card. Um, this might be one of the last times that we we do predictions. Like uh, the, the prediction videos are are kind of watered down. Um, we might stick to a certain premise of it, but we're going to shift the show and do something a little different. We're going to bring a little bit more knowledge to the table. Um, so we'll see where it goes. But this show kind of entices a little bit of a prediction video just for the mere fact that there's so many things that people aren't bringing up that I do want to bring up. So uh, we're going to break down the main card. 
Um, let me just open this up. And we'll start with the main event, obviously, which is uh, Alex Pieta and, uh, and Jamal Hill. Now, you know, I have a lot to say about this fight. And, um, you know, this is not me being a hater of any of the fighters. This is just me talking normal. You know, um, when you look at this fight from a stylistic perspective, uh, you would look at Jamal Hill and you would say, yeah, this guy is fluid. He's got good movement. He's got sharp hands. He's got, um, you know, he throws good combinations. He's got good timing. He's got good durability. You know, he's shown his durability. He's fought a, a decent level of competition. I wouldn't say he's fought a great level. I think he's fought a decent level of competition. But he wins, right? He wins. I mean, he's got a couple blips in the radar. He had, obviously, the Paul Craig one that people aren't giving Paul Craig credit for, which is crazy to me, because he broke his arm. Like, he put him in a submission and broke his arm. He absolutely 1,000% beat Jamal Hill. Paul Craig beat Jamal Hill. There's no way around it. You know, so if you're going to give someone like Chris Weidman credit for beating Anderson Silva on a broken leg, you better give Paul Craig his his flowers for beating Jamal Hill. Because um, that was a legitimate submission that snapped his arm. That wasn't a freak accident. All right, so when you look at him, though, what is his? What are like the flaws of him a little bit when, when you see him at full health? He doesn't have great footwork. You know, he doesn't have great movement. He keeps his hands low. He's very hittable. You know, he, he's got a very boxer type style but he does throw kicks he does have some nasty head kicks we've seen him rock glover to share with a nasty head kick we'll go right back to it um but he's very susceptible to leg kicks that's one thing about him you could see by his stance he they, they label him as a southpaw but he does kind of switch on and off but he doesn't really leave his feet he doesn't really have that bouncing movement where he can kind of get out of the way and he doesn't really check kicks all that well he never did um, you know, and now he's coming off a situation where this boils back to, you know, one of the videos I did a long time ago about Yuri Prohoshka, where everybody thought Yuri was going to be um, Poetan. And I said, you guys were fucking crazy. Like, you guys are crazy for thinking that this guy, when Dana White says it was the nastiest injury he's ever seen, that he was just going to come back being the type of fighter he is, being that, that, that timing, off-kilter, off-beat timing fighter that he is that he was going to just hop right back in the cage and take on an elite level world-class striker like Poetan was absolutely ridiculous like that was a ridiculous stake by probably 80 percent of the community you know and I said there's no way like there's no way that's happening and look what happened he ends up getting knocked out um clean I don't care what anybody says they said oh you know it was an early stoppage call it what you want the guy fell back he got knocked out it was over um, so now you got a situation where, you know, you got kind of Jamal Hill in this situation in a sense. The only difference in this is we've never seen, you don't, you rarely see, uh, Achilles injuries in MMA, right? Like, so you don't know really what to compare it to. Like, how bad is this injury? How much is it going to affect him? If he was a guy who was like really on his feet a lot, moving a lot, then you'd say he's on the balls of his feet a lot. Like it's constant pressure on his Achilles but there's there's not you know he's kind of flat-footed when he fights the problem I do have with this is people aren't understanding that this guy had a rupture a complete 100% rupture which I don't care who your surgeon is your surgeon can make you recover 100% if he's really good but you still have to recover you still have to go through the recovery process that doesn't mean it's going to recover faster or it's going to recover any slower or it's going to recover. It only means that the recovery the recovery of your injury is going to heal closest to 100% that it will. The exercises, the rehab, your genetics play a big role in how you recover and how fast you recover. That's not the surgeon. The surgeon's going to do a fantastic job He's and the surgeon that he has is the top, top of the top. That'll tell you. Okay, but, you know, that's more of the official time after it's done where does he stand is he gonna have any issues with it um is it is it is it tight is it strong yes 1000 percent. when he's 100 percent healed because of his surgeon because of all the experience his surgeon has had with top level athletes i'm 100 percent positive that when he is ready like completely ready to go jamal hill 1000 percent will be close to 9 100 percent 98 99 but he's not there yet. If you guys think that he's 100% coming off an Achilles rupture, okay, when it's, it takes one year, it takes one full year 
for you to be able to really put hardcore weight bearing on a ruptured Achilles tendon. Now, I never ruptured my Achilles, but I've had numerous Achilles injuries. When I was younger and I was growing up, um, I was a catcher and obviously, you know, in football. And I would get up to throw somebody out at second base and I would hear a pop. And I used to have the same issue over and over and over with my Achilles tendon. The same thing when I was playing any sport. If I cut the wrong way or I cover, it was about a two-year refractory period where I would constantly just aggravate my left Achilles tendon. Was it my right? No, it was my right Achilles tendon. And um, and the doctor said, you know, it's, it's growing pains because he's growing because I was growing really quick at the time. Um, you know, so that I didn't believe. I just thought like I honestly had an issue with my Achilles tendon. It was it maybe genetically was too short. At that time, I didn't know. But now that I got older, I was like something was off there. Something wasn't right there. And it wouldn't snap. I never needed surgery, but it would literally, you would hear like a little pop, like it would just pull and tear a little bit. And I was out for a week and it was fucking painful. When I tell you painful, it was painful. You know, I've dealt with, you know, recovery with some people that I know who had full ruptured Achilles tendons, really good athletes, like really, really good athletes that it took them a year, took them a year to even start feeling like normal again, like to have a perfect gait. And to have the confidence to put that weight on it and move around, you know, so if it takes you that long, then how the hell did this guy recover, have a full camp and then fight and get ready for a fight in, in less than eight months or nine months? He, you can't. When did he start training? Do you think that he literally six months later, this guy went full tilt in camp for, for eight, eight to 10 weeks? No. He spent the majority of his camp recovering. There was no way that this guy did a did a full camp on 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 you know did as much as he can um, like this. There's just no way. Like you can't. You just can't. You know. You just you, you you literally can't. You know. So you take that and you couple with him coming off the sideline being heavy. He has no discipline. That I will tell you. Jamal Hill is a good fighter when he's clocked in and he's dialed in. But on the offseason, you could tell this guy eats whatever he wants. He blows up and he just really don't care. You know, he's almost like a Patty Pimlet in that sense. That starts to catch up with you, especially when you're sedentary and you're just laying there and you're doing nothing. And you let, mind you, he couldn't do anything. But, you know, these are all factors that you have to, you have to kind of play in. Now, if you were taking 100% Jamal Hill, never got injured, he's constantly active, and you're taking 100% Alex Pieta, you can have a pretty good conversation about, dude, I don't even know if I want to go near this fight. Like, I don't even know if I want to go near this fight right now. You know what I mean? Like, this is a guy who's got, who, who's very hittable, um, but he's got fast hands. He's, he showed that he's very durable. Then on the other side, you got a guy who wants to kind of avenge his coach's loss. Um, high level kid, but he's also could be chinned and he's hittable. Eh, you know, maybe, but on this, this here, when you got a guy who's literally in camp, he's training, he's healthy, he's active, and then you're getting a guy that's kind of rolling off the couch, how can you literally take money and put that on that guy? You like, It's the same thing I said about Yiri. It's the same thing I said about Cedric Dumas. It's the same thing I said about all these guys. Like, You can't do it, dude. Like, you can't intelligently tell me that you're going to, like, you could take money and you could just be like, shh. I have no idea what's going to look, what his Achilles tendon's going to look like. I have no, I have no idea. I'm just assuming that he's going to be the Jamal Hill that he was when he went right before he got injured. So shh, take my money. That's like a really uneducated way to, to play. And that's not me telling you that he's going to win or lose. That's just me telling you like you're throwing a dart at a dartboard at that point. Like, you have no idea what this guy's going to look like. You don't, you're not in his house. You don't know the way he eats. You don't know, the, like, how, how much training he's got. And for all you know, he got that phone call, and the UFC said, look, how are you feeling? Eh, you know, I'm pretty sturdy, you know, but I feel, I feel, I've, 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 I've been better. Well, listen, here's the deal, dude. This is the payday that we're offering you for UFC 300 to save the card. This is your pay-per-view points. These are your incentives. This is this. This is that. If your doctor clears you and you feel like you want to fight... It's there for you. You don't think he's going to be like, if his doctor cleared him, of course he's going to. You know the payday he's getting for this? This is UFC 300. He's going to take his chance. Any fighter's going to take their chance with a payday like this. It's a huge payday. It's UFC 300. Main event. Huge pay-per-view card. I, I mean, of course. If the doctor says, listen, you may not be ready, but that thing ain't going anywhere. 
So you want to take your chance? Don't worry about it. It's not going anywhere. He's going to say, you know what? I'm going to sign the paper. I'm going to see what happens. Anything can happen. It's a fight. And I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying, but you never rule things like that out. When money talks, everything else comes into play. Like, a lot of things go out the window. So my prediction for this fight, to be honest with you, is I just think that that leg is going to get attacked way too much. And for people saying, well, he's a southpaw, it was his other leg, it's false. It's a lie. He does not fight southpaw. He fights southpaw 50% of the time. He switches off. He switches on. And believe it or not, he goes more orthodox when he's looking to attack. And when he's looking to attack and he's coming forward, that's when Poetan's probably going to start chipping away at that leg. And if he switches off, he'll chip at the other leg. And if he switches off, he'll chip at the other leg. So... I just think it, it's it's a, it's going to be a little bit too many mind gymnastics for him to get in there, take that first leg kick, you know, wonder if it's going to get hurt, wonder how many kicks he can take. What if that first kick hits him and it stings? And it really has nothing to do with his Achilles tendon. It just has to do with, holy crap, like I've never got kicked like that before. What runs through his mind then? Like, I'm going to back that foot up now for the rest of this fight, and I got to fight worth, uh, uh, you know, I got to fight this way for the rest of the fight, and it's on your mind, and you're backing up, and now you know I either got to be all the way in or all the way out because I can't be mid range because he's going to peg and ring my. There's a lot that goes into this, man. There's a lot of question marks that Jamal Hill has going into this fight that whether he wants to say it to you or not, he's thinking it. He's thinking it. It's just human nature. So I can't go with that. If he wins, I wouldn't be completely blown away. I think it's a great story if he wins, but I got to go with Alex Pieta, and I'm going to go with Alex Pieta by knockout. Um, all right, next fight. This is the fight that I honestly think should have been uh, the main event. Um, and that is, hold on, let me get to this. All right, that is, uh, while, no, not this one, the next one. Wally Zhang and um, Jan Zinan. This is not really a great fight. Like, people think this is going to be some great fight. Um I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I mean, you have fighters that are really, really good fighters um, and capable fighters and fighters that do belong in the UFC. And then you have special fighters. And Zianan is a good fighter. Really good. Chinese fighter. Um, a lot of heart. Um, throws a lot of volume. She's in there to fight. She's going to, get, she's going to fight for your dollar. But then you have someone like Wally Zhang who is a special fighter she's good everywhere she's better everywhere um and she's gonna show it saturday night like for people who think that you know jan zina is gonna win this fight i i'd like to have a sit down with them or if you know people who think that like she's really gonna win this fight have them hit me up on twitter at the mad lab MMA, at, you know at mad lab MMA. i love to hear their their rhymes and like where they think that she's gonna beat wally zang like like i would love for them to do that like if if you think so Comment below. Like, where does she beat Zhang? Um, if you know somebody that really thinks that she's going to win, tell them to comment below or have them hit me up on Twitter and at me. And I, like, I've seen a lot of people thinking that she's going to win this fight. And I'm saying either I'm really missing something or they just don't see how good Zhang really is. So I'm picking Zhang. I'm saying Zhang gets it done within three rounds. I don't, I don't think this thing gets extended. Um, I, I mean, I guess it can be extended, but I don't see this thing going all five. I think Zhang finishes her. I think she's got her everywhere. I think she's got her on the feet. I think she's got her on the ground. I think she's. I think she has her everywhere. I think she's got her with the cardio. I think she has her with the durability. Like she's just, she's a special fighter, man. She's a special. She's going to be around for a while. You know, she'll be. She may lose. She may lose here. You know, one drop, one come back, but. She's going to be like a Max Holloway. She's never going to go away. Like, she's always going to be there. She's always going to be contending. She's either going to have the strap or not have the strap, but then come back for it. Like, she's going to be here for a while. And you know what? Zianon is too. She's going to be here for a while too, but she's just not that level. She's not. And I don't think she's ever going to be um, that level. So, I think Zhang is the flagship of, of China, even though they're both of them are, you know, from China, uh, representing the, the country very, very well. But there can only be one great one coming out of there. And it's just, it's not even close. Zhang wins this fight um, eight out of ten times. This should have been the main event. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. This fight was one of the fights that I've had the hardest, one of the hardest issues with. I mean, they're all very hard. But this one I had a lot of issues with. Um, you know, when you look at Justin Gaethje, you look at a guy who 
I, I'm, I was a victim of this, man. I was one of the guys that when he first came into the UFC, I was like, there's no way this dude's going to last. Like, he just can't. Like, there's no way this dude is going to last. And, you know, as time went on, I started really, be- like, believing, like, I'm really going to be right about this. Like, this guy is just not going to last. And then I started writing my articles, and I was like, well, he's still here. <laughs> like, the guy's still here. And he's still taking beatings, and he's still winning fights, and he's still getting bonuses. But it's going to happen. Like, it's eventually going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. Then I said, like, listen, it's obviously this kid is a freak of nature, but he needs to change something. Like, something needs to change or his career is going to be shortened. Like, there's no way it's not humanly possible that you could be in this. The guy's had, like, 13 bonuses. I think every one of his fights have hit a bonus at some stretch. It's insane. You know, and then you got to remember, forget about the UFC. What about his career before the UFC when he was having these highlight finishes and rocked on his feet? And, like, he, he had a career of wars before the UFC. Before you guys have been watching him in the UFC, you got to see some of his other stuff. This dude has been nothing but wars his entire life. Trevor Whitman comes along. And Trevor Whitman does what I have been wanting Justin Gaethje to do for probably five years. Just settle down, understand how talented you are, and, and, and just use, utilize some functionality and technique to, for the longevity of your life and your career and your, and your scruples. And I could honestly say that going into that situation, I knew it would help, but I didn't think it would be like this. Like, I didn't think that Trevor Whitman, I have always respected him. I always thought he was an elite trainer. I always knew, like, he was a real fighter's trainer. But to be able to generate, you know, penetrate through Justin Gaethje when he's so deep into his career at this point and be able to, like, get through to him and say, look, this is these are the functionalities, like, that we need to change. Like, this has to change. You don't want to use a wrestling? Okay. But you're going to get functional with your striking. You're going to get more technical. You're going to utilize your leg kicks a little bit more. You're going to understand the science of range. You're going to understand how to cut a corner, how to bait a trap, how to not get baited into these firefights. Like You're going to understand all these things. If you don't want to utilize your wrestling that you have been so good at your entire life since you were a kid, if you just want to abandon that and you, you want to collect checks and that's what you're going for, you're going to do things my way. And he listened, man. And he listened. And that's insane. That's like really, really, really insane. If you really think about it, if you go through the Justin Gaethje from just a couple of years ago to Justin Gaethje now, he's a completely different fighter. He's that same guy when it comes to, um, when it comes to, uh, like when he gets buzzed. When he gets buzzed, he tries to get it back. It's the same thing with Cody Garbrandt, right? Like even though Cody Garbrandt looks a lot better now, uh, a lot more composed, you're wired a certain way. You're wired a certain way. It's almost like somebody who who is completely normal when they're when they're sober, and then you get some nasty drunks. Then as soon as they start drinking alcohol, no matter when or what or how happy or how sad they are, they turn into a nasty drunk. It's just they're wired that way, you know. And it's the same thing when you get buzzed with a punch. Like when you get buzzed, you go through a situation of fight or flight. Some guys will kind of you know flight away a little bit and try to get their scruples back and maybe take a shot. Or, or, or do, and some people will just fight. Like they just, they know nothing else. They got to go and they got to get it back and they got to fight. And that's the way guys like Gaethje and, and, and Garbrandt are wired. So that's when you will see that come out in him. But his technical ability when he is completely pigeonholed in and he's not buzzed is a completely different fighter. Like he doesn't look for war. He looks to pursue you. He looks to throw hands with you. He throws a little bit of caution to the wind. But he looks for more precision. He looks for more range management. He looks for more calculated and uh, economical striking. Like, he's not all over the place, you know. And he knows how good his leg-kicking game is. Like, he knows that's a, that's a bread-and-butter thing for him, especially with guys who are a little bit more athletic than him. That's a way for him to keep them in place, you know. So then you move over to Max Holloway, and you're like, what can you, what can, what can you say bad about this guy? Like, this guy has been in so many fights against so many top-level competition, so much top-level competition that it's it's unheard of. And the guy continues to break records. Like, it's, you know, I, I, I mean, I remember the first fight I saw him throw over 200 strikes. I'm like, holy shit, 200 strikes. Then he beats that. He goes to 300 strikes. Then he fights Calvin Kaner and he throws over 400 strikes. It's like, what? wait, what? 
Like, this guy just, like, gets, like, there's no end to his gas tank. There's no end to his volume. The lactic acid is non-existent in Max Holloway's body. It's non-existent. If you just stood there and you just threw 400 jabs, just sit there, bop, 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 and just sat there and did that 400 times, you literally would, like, start shaking your arm out, the lactic acid, your hands. This guy's throwing 400, 400 and something that are landing and, and hitting, and he's getting hit, and this dude's lactic acid is just non-existent. Like, he doesn't get tired. This guy's cardio is absolutely insane. And you can't doubt the guy that he, maybe he could throw 600 in a fight. Like, we've seen him do two. We thought that was crazy. We've seen him do 290. Thought that was crazy. We saw him do over 400. We thought that was absolutely insane. Who's to say he can't throw over 500? I mean, really, who's to say? You know, the thing that I think people are looking at a little too deep with Max Holloway is they're looking at, um, you know, they're looking at his fight with, uh, with Poirier. And I think when he fought Poirier, you got to remember, he was on like six weeks notice. Um, he was not in the greatest shape. He was putting on weight at the wrong pace. And what I mean by that is there is a right way and a wrong way to put on weight. Um, and I know when I was in college, like we used to do these, these, uh, these weighing drills inside the water, like the, the water will tell you so much more when you're in there. And we used to do all these different things to see what was good weight, what was bad weight. And, um, I remember, you know, uh, there was a discussion that we had how like the quality of size, it's almost like when you, when you, when you lose weight, right? Say you go on a diet, say like for me, I'm right now I'm 260. Okay. So I'm, in another month or so, I start really cutting down. And when I really start cutting down, the first like 10 pounds comes off like that. I mean, it comes off rapidly. Then all of a sudden, you'll start going, wait a minute, now it's a pound a week. Instead of 10 pounds, now it's a pound. It's because the first 10 pounds are water. The first 10 pounds just come out of you. It's just, it's nothing but water. That's all that is. You, you, even you guys out there, if you're watching, it's a guaranteed. If you just drank a gallon of water a day, um, start cleaning up your diet just for like a week and just did a little bit of cardio, you'll lose about 10 pounds. It'll be all water. And then after that, then you're carving into fat. You're carving into fat, so it's a little bit harder. But the same rule applies with gaining weight. You can gain weight like this. You could put on water weight like this. You can put on 10 pounds like this. It's not an ounce of muscle. It's not an ounce of anything. It's an ounce. It's 10 pounds of water. So Max, like, generally just put on water weight. Like, he just, he was eating. He was, for, he had to get, gain weight quick. He had to put on size quick. And you could see his body was smoother. He, he even admits to having a muffin top during that fight. I mean, shit, if that's a fucking muffin top, I don't know what I had when I was heavier. But, uh, you know, um, but you could see. In this camp, he's putting on the size properly. He had the whole camp to really put on weight, to, to weight train, to put on like real, real pounds, real pounds. One pound of muscle blows away 20 pounds of water. So he was able to put on real pounds. He feels good. He looks good. So with this fight, and I, I, I see it being a lot more competitive than people think. I think people think because Dustin Poirier was able to kind of bully him in there, um, you know, and his punches seem so much more effective they not looking at the fact that, yeah, they looked more effective because he was on a little bit of shorter camp and he was just kind of gorging himself to gain weight. He wasn't tra training weights. Just because you're a certain weight means nothing. He did it right this time. He's going to be leaner. He's going to be more defined. He's going to, his cardio is going to be better. His strength index is going to be up. I think you're going to see a really good Max Hollywood. The problem is the leg kicks. That's where the issue lies for me with this fight. Like, is he going to be able to find a way around the leg kicks? Max Holloway is a great boxer. Um, doesn't ultimately uh, uh, check leg kicks. He's not a guy that to, uh, to really like take the fight to the ground and grapple. He wants to stand and he wants to throw volume with you. Justin Gaethje on the other hand, he's the much stronger fighter. He's going to look to really you know download um, you know Max's movement and really try to keep him in place and really just try to work on his legs, slow him down, make him a, make him a sitting duck. No more moving target now. Now I'm just going to work on your legs, work on your legs, and boom. Now you're sitting, you're limping, you're a little bit tender, and now I can start teeing off on you on power. And Justin might walk through a couple to get to that one or two good shots that he may need to try to put Max out. But Max is very resilient, man. Like, he's really, really, really resilient. Uh, and I don't, I think it's going to be easier said than done. And I think if you look at the, the punch stats, if you guys do go by punch stats... And you see, like, Justin Gaethje's, like, highest punch count, I think it's, like, 140, you know, uh, since he's been in the UFC. You know, so decent, but it's not like he's throwing these oodles and oodles of volume. Um, 
And at one, and if you look at the fights that he's lost, um, you know, outside of the ones that maybe he just not, you know, he knocks somebody out, you know, halfway through the fight because all his shit is highlight stuff. He's lost guys who have out volumed him. If you look at the couple guys that have beat him by like decision and stuff, it was because they they kind of out volumed him. They kind of like they got the edge on him in striking. I could see that happening here. I could see Max really just putting on a volume clinic. You know, I could see Justin coming out, getting hot, winning the first round, maybe even the second round. Uh, and then once Max downloads the information, he starts just letting that jab go and letting that jab go and moving around the cage and just kind of losing him in translation a little bit. And I think Justin might start throwing for defenses at that point. He might really start throwing for defenses. And the speed of Max and the, the, um, um, the, the cardio of Max might start weighing and tightening that gap of the rounds that Justin won in the beginning. So I, I this is a, a crazy... I, like, I don't even know if you could literally sit here and predict this fight. I'm going to go with Max. I'm going to take the volume over over the, the stationary leg-kicking, you know, striking of, of uh, Gaethje. I think that Max has done this time and time again. Like, you just can't count this guy out. Like I said, when you think he can't do any more, he does it. Like, do you remember when everybody said that this dude was, like, brain fried? When they said that he had, like, pugilistic syndrome when he was, like, punch drunk and his interviews looked horrible. And then he comes out and he puts 400, he puts over 400 strikes on Calvin Cater and shuts everybody up. Like, the guy's still young. Yes, he's been in wars. But, dude, this dude, I, I just don't count him out. I don't count Justin Gaethje out either. That's what's crazy about this fight. I just, I got, I'm going to go with Max. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the dog in this one. I'm gonna take Max. I mean, anytime you're giving me, do you know, you're telling me Max Holloway's gonna be a dog. Like, how do you not? You know, how do you not? But great fight. Uh, whoever wins this fight, it's gonna be a banger. You know, so I don't think you could be right or wrong on either side. I'm gonna sit here and say if you pick Justin Gaethje, I'm gonna say you know what, I could see it because he would probably win this way. If you say Max Holloway, I'd be like, I could see it because I would think he would win this way. So it's really who gets what they want. It's really gonna be Justin Gaethje's ability to capitalize on the leg kicks and it's going to be max holloway's ability to kind of elude them check some of them and just dump a boatload of volume on them so may the best man win um next fight charles oliviera and sarkiwi and this is the fight on the card that i had the most issues with um i gotta be honest with you like i'm, I'm still super torn on this fight um i already wrote the article um over for uh, the mad lab mma.com and this is a fight, like, a lot of these fights, even though these are these are predictions, like, I have them open-ended where I got to watch the weigh-ins and I got to see what's going on there before I really, you know, uh, solidify, like, a confident pick. Like, it's it's that's how close these fights are. I mean, it could be just something where a guy steps on a scale and his color looks a little bit off. And I'm like, that's enough for me going the other way, you know? So that's how close these fights are. So with this fight... How do you how do you count out Ch Chucky Olives? I mean, he's done it time and time and time and time and time again. You think you got him beat. You knock him down in the first round. You, you test his chin. You put him down. And then all of a sudden, you're celebrating and you're fucking counting your money. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. And he takes your back and he chokes you out. I, I mean, how many times is he going to do it? The problem with that and the reason why I'm looking at this a little bit different is because a lot of these guys that put it on Olivier in round number one, they're afraid of going to his guard and follow it up. They don't follow it up. They allow him to gain his wits again. They allow him to kind of shake it off and get back up. And then he, it's like a second breath of life. He's got a second opportunity. Everybody's afraid to like kind of jump in his guard or everyone's trying to, afraid to get too close and maybe get on top of him and start hammering away on him because they're afraid he might grab a leg, he might grab an arm, he might, you know, somehow get into a position to take your back. So they kind of back up and they, they'll call him up and he's sitting there like this on his back and he's collecting his wits and then a the ref calls him up and now you're game again. So it's almost like you got to beat him, to, like some of these guys have to beat him twice in a fight. Like you, you beat him once, but you were afraid to finish him. Now you're calling, now you got to beat him again. Tarukian's not going to be afraid to jump in his guard. Like, Tarukian knocks him down. He's not going to be afraid to jump in his guard. And we know how good Tarukian is on the ground. Look what he did in his debut fight against Makachev. I mean, he gave Makachev all he can handle. You know, so uh, this is a fight, honestly, though, where Tarukian's still young. Tarukian can be reckless. Tarukian can, can, can do something where we're like, oh, my God, why did he just do that? And 
Chuck Yalov grabs his neck and the fight's over. I don't care how good he is. I don't care how good Sarukian is. I don't care who he Chuck Yalov is fighting. If he latches onto a limb or latches onto your neck, it's over. It's over. Once something is locked in, it's locked in. And if anybody knows how to lock things in, there's only certain guys. There's like the Brian Ortegas of the world. There's, you know, um, the Rodolfo Vieiras of the world. There's Charles Oliveira. Those guys, once they lock something in, you're not getting out. There's other guys. Yeah, sure. They lock something in. You can work your way out of it. It's not locked. They told you they don't, they don't have a good, you know, neck series. They don't know how to kind of um, uh, transition over to, a, to another grip or, you know, like someone like Ortega when he, when he changed his grip in, in mid-flight. Like, a lot of guys don't know how to do that. Guys like Charles Oliveira, once he locks you up, you're locked up. There's, there's nothing you're doing about it. You know, so I don't care how good Sarukian is. If he makes a mistake, one mistake in this fight, he's going to get choked out. Or he can get knocked out. Like, listen... Charles Oliveira, his, his striking is very underrated. The problem is this. He could be sparked. He could be chinned very easy. And he's chinned in the majority of his fights. But like I said, everybody's afraid to kind of follow up on him. They're, they're kind of afraid to just jump in and follow up on him. And I get it. I, I understand it. I do get it. But Sarugian's not going to be afraid. Sarugian will jump right in his guard, start ground to pound him. He's not going to fear nothing. So that's the reason why I'm leaning Armand a little bit. Because I think he's going to be able to finish the job that the other guys were afraid to finish. But being young, being, you know, um, in that moment where you see you have him rocked and now you're going in for the kill, sometimes you can go a little bit haywire and you can make a mistake. And that's when Charles Olivier will capitalize. So I'm picking Armin, but I got to be honest with you, with these odds, and I think I saw like plus 450 um, uh, Charles Olivier by submission. Like, those are some tasty odds. Like, it's not all about who you think is going to win. It's about the, the 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 value. Like, there's there's times where I'm going to say, well, you know, I think this guy's going to win. But holy shit, did you see those odds? I'll take a swing on that. Screw it. So this could be one of those situations where if you guys are really looking for value and you're looking for a couple dog shots or some small sprinkles on on a, on a prop, I mean, one of the best submission guys, uh, you know, op opportunistic submission guys in recent day of, of MMA is Charles Oliveira. And if you're taking those odds at plus 450, plus, plus 500, I mean, I don't see why I would hate you for putting a sprinkle on it. You know, but I am going to go with Sarukian um, for that fight. I'm going to go with Sarukian by, I'm, I'm going to say he, he rocks him on the feet, jumps into his guard, and actually finishes him on the ground. Um Next fight, don't ask me why this fight um, is even on the main card. It's actually insulting. When you guys got, you got guys like Jim Miller, you got guys like, um, you know, I mean, so many guys. You got Holly Holm. You got all these people that deserve to be on the main card. And you put Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage. Like, I mean, who is this guy blowing? Like, really? I mean, let's, let's be real here. I mean, you're, I could see if you put him up against like a stud. You're like, we're going to test him at UFC 300. We're going to put him on the main card, and we're going to literally test this dude with a stud. I'd be like, I'm here, you know, I'm here for it. Let's go. But you're putting him against Cody Brundage. He's a minus 2,500 favorite, and you're putting him on the main card. Like, come on, dude. Come on. You know, put him on the prelims. Keep him on the prelims. He shouldn't even be on this card. Actually, I don't mind him being on the card, but come on. Put him on the, put him on the, the, the prelims, prelims. You know, especially if he's fighting Cody Brundage. But anyway, this is a fight. Honestly, you guys know what's going to happen here. I mean, it's minus 25. Does anyone deserve to be a minus 2,500? No. Nobody in fighting deserves to be a minus 2,500. Nobody. Um, do I see a path for Cody Brundage to win this fight? That's really the question of the hour. And I could say, sure. I mean, I guess. Anything can happen in a fight, right? If I was his coach and I was in his corner, I'd say, look, man. I know you're a good wrestler. You know you're a good wrestler. But you're not a better wrestler than him. Like, you're just not. Like, let's just face it. Like, you're not even on... You can't even scratch his jock strap when it comes to wrestling. So, let's just throw it out the window. Let's call it for what it is. And just go out there and swing for the fences and try to knock this dude out. Like, go out there. Don't try to take him down. Don't try to wrestle with him. Don't try to have a jock measuring contest with him because he's going to flatten you out and he's going to finish you right out of the gate. There's not a shot in hell you're going to wrestle with him. I'm your coach. I'm telling you this. Go in there. Throw your hands. Throw leather. 
get reckless, try to make him get reckless, and see if you can get the, you could catch him on the button at right spot, right shot, right time. The crowd goes wild. That's it. I mean, that's what he needs to do. Is it going to work? Probably not. But that's what he needs to do. He can't come out there all strategic and you know, you know, coming out there and whap and whap and, and faking, you know, fainting takedowns and stuff like that. It's not going to work. Bo Nickel's going to destroy him in that case. You just got to go in there and act like you're leaving a bar on 10 shots of tequila and you feel no pain and you're going to be Tank Abbott and you're going to get into a bar fight right now and you're going to throw your hands and you're going to see if something connects. That's literally what he's got to do. And I hate to say it, but that's the position that the UFC put him in. You know, and if that happens, you could be sitting on a really nice ticket, even if you put, even if you put like $10 on it. Um, so, yeah, great card. I mean, unbelievable card. If you guys want the full write-ups, I mean, you guys, you have no idea how, how much time I put into this card. Um, I mean, if you guys only came over for the week for nineteen ninety nine, I mean, how, you have no idea the value you're getting. You have no idea. Plus, you get the, the Discord. You're hanging out with us all night watching the fights. We're talking back and forth. You get the live stream um, for your DFS lineups right before, you know, the weigh-ins, the, right after the weigh-ins, the, the, that morning of the fight. Um, you know, a private podcast. You guys would come in for a week, and you guys would stay. That's how That's how good of it. Plus, the contest that we're throwing with all the food that we're giving away. Um, so, you're not only supporting that, you're, you're also winning things but you're supporting the fighters like come check us out for a week trust me you'll see that there's there's no other mixed martial arts combat sports community we sweat boxing together every, but bare knuckle together i mean it's trust me when i tell you if you're looking for a good community to be a part of that's not toxic which there's not many of them out there um because i know i i've been a part of some companies and i've been affiliated with some people that do have discords that it's nothing but toxic um come and check us out um, one more thing I do want to discuss, this whole Tyson thing, right? So, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I think I understand uh, a little sneaky situation that they're doing with this Tyson fight. Um, I'm under the impression that this this fight is, is paid on a sliding scale. So now, I don't know if you guys know what I mean by sliding scale. So basically, Mike Tyson is getting paid more money for as long as this fight goes. Uh, so, um, if he gets if he knocks out Jake Paul in the first round, he makes bare bones minimum. If it goes to the second round, he makes a little bit more. If it goes to the third round, he makes a little bit more. If it goes to the fourth round, more. Fifth round, more. Sixth round, more. Seventh round, more. Eighth, eighth round, he gets max money. So, the longer this fight goes, the more money Mike Tyson makes. The less, the less time it goes, the less he makes. Think about that world that we live in, right? That he's getting paid on a, sli a sliding scale where Dana White will give you a bonus for a first round knockout, like for a crazy knockout, like right out of the gate, you know, boom, you're getting 50 G's. Jake Paul's team is assembling a sliding scale contract that will literally pay him more money the longer he allows it to go. Just some food for thought for you. To let you like to give you a little idea. Now, does that mean a lot to Mike Tyson? Is the, is it more about money or is it more about legacy? It, you know, I don't know what the pay bumps are from round. It's almost like being a police officer or a fired or, or like a, a fireman where you get paid in steps. I don't know what the steps are. I don't know how big the increments are. But think about that. Think about if you were put in that situation now to do an eight round fight, it changes things a little bit. It changes things a little bit if you're not so worried about your legacy, right? All right, well, I, if I could go in there, I can knock this dude out right now. Boom, I can end this whole thing, but I'm getting paid minimum. Or I could drag it out second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh. I go all the way eight rounds, but then I'm tampering with me being 50-something years old, having a terrible gas tank, and maybe fading down the stretch. I'll still get all my money. I'll still get max money, but I might lose. Where do you go from there? You know what I mean? So it's... There's a lot of things that you guys got to look at before you judge, like, if this is a real fight. This ain't a real fight. This is a real fight with heavy sliding scale stipulations to it. So when you listen to these outlets, oh, Tyson's going to kill him. You know, I saw this one guy on YouTube, and I, I'm going to say his name. I'm going to say his name because I, I, I feel like I got to give him credit for it. Actually, I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going to say his name right now because there's nothing really to give him credit for it. But what he did was he, he showed three 
Um, he showed three views of... He's been talking about Tyson nonstop, this guy. He's been talking about Tyson nonstop. He's going to knock him out. And then, you can see he doesn't really... He's not a purist in boxing. You could just see. Because anybody who looks at Mike Tyson like the greatest, most fearful boxer in the world, like you know that they weren't really a product of boxing purism. You know, they were a boxing fan of the heavyweight division back in the 90s and 80s and stuff like that, and that's it. But it ends there. Like, they were Tyson fans. They weren't boxing purists. So you could see, like, he was kind of that guy. You know what I mean? And that's fine. A lot of people are like that. Look, McGregor got people into MMA, MMA right? So it's fine. But this, this guy literally took three videos. He took a video of, um, who are the three guys? He took a video of Mike Tyson hit in an 18-inch aqua bag. He had a video of Evander Holyfield getting ready for Roy Jones hitting mitts. And then he had another video of Jake Paul hitting focus mitts. So he had two guys hitting focus mitts. And then you had Mike Tyson hitting an aqua bag. And he's like, bro, look how look at the difference in devastation. Look at the difference in power. You're telling me that he's not going to knock him out? So I never chime in on things. I'll just kind of watch him. And I had to chime in. I was like, bro, like... You cannot, like, this is where you could tell, like, maybe he's never bogged, like, he, he doesn't understand. Focus mitts are exactly what they are. They're focus mitts. It's meant for precision. It's meant for timing. It's meant for range management to see, like, if you're, you're popping at the end of your shots. Like, that's what it's for. It's not to put steam on, on the mitts. Like, that's not what focus mitts are. They're exactly what they're called, focus mitts. It's literally for timing, speed, range management, um, uh, and, and, you know, working your combinations and, and it's basically what it's for. The 18-inch the aqua bag is meant for power, leverage, and force. That's why it's filled with that, 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 that water because it's easier on your joints. That's what it's meant for. It's meant to just hit hard, put power, brute force. Um, and that's what... So you got three videos. You got Mike Tyson hitting this bag that that's what it's meant for. It's meant for hard force, sheer power. And then you got two other guys hitting focus. But what do you think? What do you think the videos are going to look like? Of course, that video is going to look more devastating than two guys hitting focus mitts. You know what I mean? So just be very weird. I'm going to start updating you on the Tyson stuff because I, I've been getting like word on the stipulations once i find out more about the sliding scale i'll let you know about the sliding scale i'll see if i can get like the price breakdown maybe i can't maybe i can but uh, you know when i heard about the sliding scale i was like well this makes a lot of sense now you know we all know it's it's a um we all know it's it's, it's an exhibition match so it doesn't even matter it's not gonna it, there's no winner there's no loser unless there's a knockout it doesn't even matter it does it's insane it's insane so i'm gonna keep you guys posted on that because i'm i'm, I'm so sick of hearing um, these people making this into this big event and how Tyson's going to be the king again. And uh, it's just insane to me. It's insane to me. So I, I'll do what I can. Uh, like I said, I'm really busy with the company and doing stuff for MMA every week and stuff like that. But boxing is near and dear to my heart. It's always been. It's where I started. Uh, and I feel like I, I, I have to come out and I have to make some videos on like just solidifying the truth on certain things. Um, don't get bought and sold on this. Like, it's very easy to look at a 57-year-old guy hitting a bag for 30 seconds and be like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, look at him. Look how good he looks. And, yeah, and there's not many 57-year-old guys that can do what he does. But what about minute number two? What about minute number three and minute number four and minute number five and minute number six? What does he look like then? Not just, all right, Mike, you ready? Go. And he's, bah, 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 bah. stop. What about him having to do that for eight, eight two-minute rounds? Like, what is he going to look like then? What is he going to do when, when something's hitting him back? That, like, you got to stop, like, looking at all that stuff and, and buying into all this stuff. They're selling and selling and selling and selling and selling the fight. You know, so, and that's what they got to do. They got to sell the fight. You know, they want views. They have their little clickbait things, unstoppable force and the predator and all these crazy things. But just, you know, take some of these outlets for what they are because they're not giving you the, the, the factual information on some, of these, on some of these things. All right, listen, guys, I hope you guys enjoy the fights. Um, like I said, themadlabmma.com, come check us out. Uh, come hang out with us in Discord. Uh, if you have any questions, you can follow me at MadLabMMA on Twitter or on X, whatever it's called now. I answer all my DMs. If you guys have any questions about the site, you have any questions you have for me, uh, drop me a follow um, and let's have some fun. Mm.